This is Dateline Tampa Bay. The Keys Connection, a voyage into the heart of Florida's natural beauty and a look at the link between Tampa Bay and the preservation of the Keys. They're called the Florida Keys, but they are America's paradise. A string of tropical islands and atolls that stretches nearly 200 miles through the blue-green waters of the Gulf Stream. These gems, strung through a jeweled sea, attract millions of Americans and visitors from around the world. But there is an even greater treasure hidden just offshore. Like an aquatic crowd surrounding the Keys, the coral reefs. Ahoy, mates. I'm Bob Height. Right now, we're not in the Keys. We're in the fabulous main tank of the Florida Aquarium. But we're about to cast off with the Keys, the aquarium president, John Racanelli. It's going to be a great adventure, folks. The coral reefs of the Keys are the only coral reefs in the entire North American continent. That makes them a priceless national treasure. When we come back, we'll cast off with the Keys and visit aquarium board member Dr. Sylvia Earle aboard the Aquarius, an underwater marine science station. Irene Mayer will show us how diving technology and marine science discovery are aiding us all in the health We'll travel to Pigeon Key, the island outpost for Moat Marine Laboratory, and a great campsite for future scientists. And we'll go deep sea fishing with one of the world's foremost anglers, who's concerned about a maritime mystery, the disappearing Sargasso Sea. Almost three years, a barge has been anchored off Key Largo. It hasn't received much fanfare or even notice, but it is to the ocean what Cape Canaveral is to space. A launch pad for aquanauts who are traveling to the Aquarius. An inner space station deployed 70 feet down on the edge of the reef. Aquarius is a joint effort by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the University of North Carolina. Aquarius allows scientists to accomplish in days what would otherwise take months or even years. Working from the surface at these depths, scientists can make only two dives a day and then stay only briefly on the bottom as they must allow for decompression. But by living at depth, aboard Aquarius, they don't have to decompress until their mission is completed, allowing them to stay as many days and nights on the reef as their mission requires. As a consequence, this inner space station has allowed research on coral reefs to rocket ahead. Scientists from here make excursions down to more than 100 feet, and they have hours that they can spend. If you're diving from the surface without decompression, it takes you have only about 20 minutes you get the kind of insight that you get when, for example, you go to stay in a city or stay in a forest for a while instead of just driving through. Among the members of the Aquarius crew on this mission, world-renowned marine scientist and explorer Sylvia Earle, the former head of NOAA. Dr. Earle believes Aquarius is an essential resource in restoring and preserving the reefs and the myriad of marine life they support is more than a hole on a reef. This provides access to the sea in a different sort of way. It's as justifiable in, in many ways as having the investment in a space station. Uh, we could say, why not just send people up for bounce dives in the sky? But there is perceived to be a real reason to keep people up for prolonged periods of time, to get insights that you can't get from quick visits. And that's exactly the sort of advantage that having Aquarius sitting here on the reef for prolonged periods of time, allowing people to come and stay and to really become residents and to see the ocean from, and to see the planet from the inside out. Life support in the form of air and power flows to the Aquarius from the barge above, 
where another team of scientists and divers constantly monitors the activities and conditions below. All right, see you later. The surface crew also collects and catalogs the information and specimens gathered by the aquanauts. But their principal responsibility is the safety of those living and working below. To that end, this state-of-the-art dive platform is equipped with a hyperbaric chamber. Should divers suffer decompression sickness, or the bends, they can be treated right on site. The chamber can be put to other medical uses, too. For the full story on the chamber, here's my friend Irene Mayer. Hi, Irene. Hi, Bob. For patients like diabetics, the chamber can provide a healing breath, but for divers, it can be a lifesaver. It was first dive of the day. Little did Richard Neal know it might be the last dive of his life. We were like about 85 feet of water. They were down for about 30 minutes and returned to the boat. All of a sudden, I started feeling a little nauseous. As long as I laid on the deck and kept my eyes closed, I felt all right. If I get up and try to walk around, I would get dizzy and start throwing up again. So Richard and his buddies decided to head back. When they got in four hours later, he couldn't stand up, much less walk. Richard was taken to a nearby emergency room and was immediately airlifted to St. Joseph's Hospital in Tampa. St. Joe's has the Bay Area's only multi-place hyperbaric chamber, a device that simulates diving conditions and delivers pure oxygen at many times the normal atmospheric pressure. I think they took me down to the equivalent of about 160 feet. We were in there for six hours. They brought me out and then turned me around, put me right back in for the uh, second trip. And this was at night, and I was sleeping most of the time through there. Richard had what's called an arterial gas embolism. That's different from the bends or decompression sickness, which is usually caused by a buildup of nitrogen when you come up from depth too fast. In that case, the chamber can take you back down and bring you up slowly so the nitrogen can be released. But that wasn't Richard's problem. And I call it a pop or a pulmonary overpressurization. Dr. John Santa Maria is the medical director of the hyperbaric program at St. Joe's. And in a small scale, one of the little sacks of air popped and let air track outside his lung. That air, unfortunately for him, being in the upright position, tracked to the arterial system and went to his brain. It's very much like a stroke. It's a stroke, instead of a blood clot blocking the artery, it's an air bubble. The chamber worked for Richard by filling his blood with oxygen, which helped heal tissue damaged by the embolism. Oh, I was in hospital for five days. I think I went six or seven times through the chamber at about six hours a shot. But the chamber isn't just for divers. The majority of patients here are diabetics who come for wound care. Poor circulation won't allow even the smallest blister to heal. There's not enough blood to bring the normal oxygen to the tissue to allow normal healing. Hyperbaric treatment puts more oxygen in the blood, so that blood that does reach extremities like the legs and feet is enriched and more likely to promote healing. I got a sore foot, an ulcer on my foot. Is it getting better? Oh yeah, yeah, it's a lot better. Treatment in a hyperbaric chamber isn't for everyone with wound care problems or for every diver, but Richard Neal believes it worked for him. It could have been a lot worse, uh, but I, you know, that could have killed me. Uh, it could have put me in a wheelchair or I could be up walking around. I'm up walking around, so I'm uh, extremely thankful that they have this facility here. Back on the bottom, the Aquarius Aquanauts continue their research. But for how long? Regrettably, government funding for the project is in jeopardy. Science Director Stephen Miller. Coral reefs support a South Florida economy estimated at uh, over a billion dollars a year. That includes fisheries, diving, uh, recreational activities, and the health of the system, the condition of these reefs provide the foundation upon which people come down here to enjoy the, uh, the environment. You know, millions of people visit the Keys. Um, not too many get into space. Uh, a space shuttle mission, 500 million to a billion dollars, that's enough to run our program for over 500 years. Most importantly, we need to understand how the ocean works so people, first of all, can care and secondly, to take care of the ocean that takes care of us. 
you can help the Aquarius Project continue. Contact your representatives in Congress and let them know how you feel. Coming up, we'll head down island to Pigeon Key, island outpost for Moat Marine Laboratory, and a summer science camp for kids. And of course, we have some more work to do underwater. The Florida Keys. They've changed a lot over the years. A booming population has brought modernization and urban sprawl island style. But one island in this chain has stayed much the same. Pigeon Key is being restored and preserved for posterity. About the turn of the century, this tiny five-acre island was an important waypoint in the construction of what was then called the eighth wonder of the world, the Overseas Railroad. If Flagler hadn't decided to build this seven-mile bridge and a railroad back in the early 1900s, it'd probably still be sitting here as a, as a rock sticking out of the, what is it, the confluence of the Gulf of Mexico and Atlantic Ocean. It Dave Whitney is executive director of the Pigeon Key Foundation. But it had no significant importance, except it was just far enough down the bridge to put a construction camp. And they had 400 and some people living here. But then after they got the bridge done, they needed people to operate the bridge, and they needed people to paint the bridge and maintain it. And this became the village where they lived and, and took care of the bridge. Derailed by a hurricane in the early 30s, the train service was replaced by traffic and Pigeon Key, bypassed entirely by a new highway bridge built in the 80s, fell into obscurity. But today, thanks to the Pigeon Key Foundation, the island has a new lease on life as a national historic site. All the buildings are being faithfully restored to their original condition, and closed to the public for years, it is now open to all. They can either take a tour, they can... If they're signed up for a course, they can go diving and all that, or they can just bring a picnic basket and sit under the tree and enjoy it. Pigeon Key is not only a repository of Florida history, it's making history in the form of scientific discovery. Using the island as a base, moat marine scientists are also in the race to preserve our coral reefs. Not only essential habitat for marine life, the coral in the Keys is an essential element in Florida's economic life bringing thousands of divers and millions of dollars into our economy. John and I went along with Dr. Eric Mueller of Moat Marine as he went to work trying to unlock the secrets of the reefs. As is the case with any patient, tissue samples must be taken. Using a pneumatic drill, Dr. Mueller bores a series of cores into the coral and carefully extracts each specimen. Okay, these are colony C, and the first set was colony A. They're brought to the surface where scientist Lori McLaughlin quickly immerses them again in salt water. For Lori, this is a special assignment. The kind of work that Eric's working on is going to benefit restoration, which is the restoring areas that have been damaged by, say, vessel groundings, um, other impacts, primarily human Im impacts. And so this is very significant research that we can use it, hopefully, to cultivate corals and then take them back and transplant them in these areas where they've been removed by some impact. After hours of drilling, the cores of coral are rushed back to Pigeon Key and Dr. Mueller's unique coral nursery, where he's trying to identify the reef's environmental enemies. We have to, number one, know what the problem was. Number two, we have to know that that problem has been eliminated, at least that acute problem. If we have corals just dying for some reason that we don't know, it would be a waste of time for me to be putting corals back there where they may succumb to this unknown. But once we do begin to take care of those problems, then we could start restoring other areas. Dr. Mueller's research isn't just for restoring reefs, it's restoring life. Just a small area like this can be home to thousands of living creatures. But coral research isn't just for the benefit of the reefs. It's also producing some remarkable benefits for mankind. Absolutely, Bob. And when you see the medical uses for coral, you may not believe your eyes. The shapes are as varied as the colors, and its benefits now go far beyond the depths of the sea. 
You're looking at a small sphere of coral which is used as an artificial eye implant. The coral implants help patients like Ed Wright who lost his natural eye in a fishing accident. The coral sphere helps hold the shape of the eye socket and eventually becomes part of the body. You then have nerves and vessels growing into this implant and then it becomes truly a part of the person. It's not a foreign object anymore like an acrylic sphere would be. Muscle tissue is attached to the coral, giving patients natural eye movement. A prosthesis painted to look like a natural eye slips over the implant like a contact lens. Take a look over towards the right, now towards the left. And because of the vision of researchers, coral has found many other medical uses. And you can actually see this wider area is the coral bone. Dr. Roy Sanders of the Florida Orthopedic Institute says coral is also a good replacement for bone. Really anywhere where the bone gets uh, crushed and when you reposition the fragments, there's a, a void in the bone. What kind of homework do you have tonight, honey? It happened to Esther Hammer last well, year. Her knee was Jim crushed in a skiing accident. Oh, Doctors no, used to perform a second operation to get replacement bone from another part of the patient's own body. But in certain small repairs, coral can do the job, saving patients extra surgery. When you think about it, coral is sort of made of some of the same substances that bone is made of. There's a lot of calcium in there. And uh, it didn't seem all that foreign. The coral is harvested from reefs chemically processed, sterilized, and cut into a variety of shapes and sizes. The body thinks it's just bone in the body, and so it grows up to it and into it and through it. You don't have to worry about infections. You don't have to worry about HIV transmission or hepatitis, and the patient doesn't have any pain from a separate operation. Oh, you got great no, motion. I, yeah, I can. Esther Hammer is still recovering from her accident and her surgery, but the coral has done its job. I think it's going to get, keep getting better. It's mostly getting those muscles back to work in the right way again. While coral may be home to thousands of sea creatures, it has clearly found a home in the human body. Pigeon Key is not only an outpost for veteran scientists. Future scientists are welcome here too. Both Moat and Pigeon Key conduct camps here and children come from across the state and throughout the country to attend. It's hard to imagine a more peaceful yet exciting campsite for kids. And for college interns like Cheryl Bass, none more inspiring. It's wonderful because I uh, have a double major in marine biology and psychology, so it's a great experience for me. I'm learning a lot from the kids. Thanks. OK. Did you have fun? Yep. Great. <laughs> Do you know what it's called? Sea urchin. And what's special about the sea urchin? It's protection. Yeah. That's true. It's got a real neat protective system. All of these fines, there's some that are real dangerous. This one isn't real dangerous, unless, of course, you step on it barefooted. <laughs> Dr. Dan Gallagher is in charge of the camp program. We're trying to get them in touch with the environment, in touch with the world. You know, a lot of them are, are city children, suburban children, who go outdoors uh, twice a year. <laughs> they come here and they live here for three days, and they don't forget it. It's really an unforgettable experience. Pigeon Key is a very special place. It's, it was, fell into a crack in time, in a way. And that's why these island, this island and the buildings you see around here today are, are just something that's got to be preserved. And we are preserving it, and not only that, we're using it. This is working on being a world-class education center. In addition to all the activities on and around Pigeon Key, neighboring keys provide fascinating field trips. For instance, the Dolphin Research Center. It's a regular stop. Pigeon Key, rich in history, and with every young camper, creating a new legacy. Clear of the channel, the autopilot of the fishing machine 
guides her to the Gulf Stream, while her veteran crew tend to the tackle and rig for big game. Captain Wally Adams is one of the foremost sports fishermen in the world. As a consequence, his foremost concern these days is the future of the fish. We're all familiar with most of the issues, huge foreign fishing fleets with their factory ships and massive indiscriminate nets, and of course, pollution. But there is a new issue now, the harvesting of sargassum. To most of us, it's just seaweed, but to all manner of marine life, it is life itself. Sea turtles, the, the ones in the Atlantic, is that's where they go to grow up. Uh, most of your surface feeding fish, uh, that's where they grow up. It's, uh, it's not the incubator, but it's the nursery for all these fish until they mature. We found baby crabs and shrimp by the score in what was basically a handful of seaweed. But over 200 species call it home. Imagine the annihilation should this offshore habitat be subjected to massive harvesting. There's nothing that's not been done about any of it uh, because it's a practice that is in its infancy. And people are just starting to find out. Believe it or not, they're looking into harvesting the seaweed for turkey feed. John? The Florida Keys are a national marine sanctuary, one of the biggest in the entire country. That's important because these reefs are truly the rainforests of the sea. And for our kids and their kids, they represent a fabulous heritage of the future. Thank you, John. So long, everyone, and thank you for watching.